Good morning. Uh, if everyone could take their seats, appreciate that. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I want to thank everyone who's brave enough to <laughs> brave the cold outside today um, and come and hear this fascinating topic. Um, we feel very privileged here uh, to have Dr. Huang with us uh, from Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Huang is an assistant professor at the Institute of Strategic Studies at the National Defense University in the Republic of China on Taiwan. Before that, he was a visiting fellow with the Freeman Chair uh, in China Studies, so we're very glad to have him back here uh, at CSIS uh, from 2014 into 2015. Uh, he also was invited to serve as a special lecturer at PACOM in 2013. A native of Taiwan, he holds a PhD in politics from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, as well as a master's in library science and information studies from the University of North Carolina here in the US. Uh, he currently is appointed to be the director of the International Master's Program for Strategic Studies at Taiwan's National Defense University. And Dr. Huang, of course, has been well known as an expert in the area of cybersecurity strategy since he joined academia. Currently, he runs a research project on China's internet governance and censorship at the National Defense University in Taiwan. I'm also joined by my colleague, Sam Sachs, uh, who's a senior fellow in our technology policy program here at CSIS. Uh, her research focuses on innovation, cybersecurity, and emerging information and communications technology policies globally with a focus on China. She leads CSIS's China Cyber Outlook, which analyzes China's evolving ICT governance system, including data flows and privacy issues, technology sector political leadership, the build out of Chinese standards, and the global expansion of Chinese ICT companies. Before joining us here at CSIS, she launched the industrial cyber business for Siemens in Asia, focusing on energy sector cybersecurity, and previously she led China technology sector analysis at the political risk consultancy Eurasia Group. Uh, prior to this, she worked at Booz Allen Hamilton and Defense Group Inc., where she advised senior US government officials on China's science and technology development. A former Fulbright Scholar in Beijing, Ms. Sachs holds an MA from Yale University in International Relations and a BA from Brown University in Chinese Literature. So with that, um, we'll get started. Thanks again for coming and joining us today. Dr. Huang. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank uh, Chris uh, for inviting me to come back to uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, uh, to have a talk at CSIS. Uh, on the one hand, it has been a very pleasure to come back to uh, Washington, D.C. area. But uh, um, on the other hand, I feel a bit guilty to uh, keep you guys here, especially uh, during the uh, first winter storm. I heard from news saying uh, it's the coldest generally in the past 50 years. Uh, so hopefully, this room will get warm enough, uh, enough for us. Um, also, um, please forgive me my uh, very uh, weird uh, accent. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I would like to uh, learn a very beautiful British spoken English. Uh, however, I failed. So, uh, so uh, please bear with me. And uh, uh, in order to finish the, uh, the talk on time, uh, uh, if you don't mind, allow me to uh, just follow the slides, uh, rather than just telling you a very uh, disorganized story. So, um, uh, the, to the topic I would like to talk uh, is actually uh, Taiwan's cybersecurity environment. Uh, why I'm choosing this topic is because uh, I was doing this research since, I have been doing this research since I was doing my PhD. Uh, as, you, as you know, my background is information science. But uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was enforced to study in politics. So I was thinking how to build up a bridge between these two sciences. So uh, I came up with uh, cybersecurity as my uh, PhD research since then until now. So today uh, it's my honor to introduce you Taiwan's cybersecurity environment. And uh, we can talk about opportunities and also uh, challenges. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's uh, our Taiwanese NDU campus. Okay. Um, according to um, Global Risk uh, Landscape in 2017, uh, published by World Economic Forum, as you can see from the screen, um, cyber attacks has been seen as a, a top 10 risk globally in this world. So uh, in terms of uh, its likelihood and also in terms of its impact. And uh, um, th this is a very symbolic event uh, happening in 2010. There was a uh, computer breakdown uh, uh, some um, nuclear weapons has been lost uh, for 45 minutes. Uh, 
Why I'm showing this, that's because uh, some people might argue actually cyber warfare is not a real warfare compared with traditional warfares. But I would argue as long as uh, this command com and the control system of uh, traditional weapons are built up on computer systems, I think that would be the case. So um, that's why uh, we have to see cybersecurity as a very vital um, uh, issue, no matter whether the warfare is digital or traditional ones. But what does cyberspace as a potential battleground uh, mean to us? I would like to define cyberspace as a, uh, a very uh, interactive um, environment that involves interaction and uh, between people, software, and services. It is maintained uh, by the worldwide distribution of information and communication technology devices and network. Also, uh, there are some uh, major conflicts uh, in this world. I would argue it's warfare, uh, espionage, and also crime. However, the boundary between uh, these major conflicts is not very clear in cyberspace. Uh, this slide shows us uh, how cyberspace looks like in this world. On your right-hand side is our geographical world, but left-hand side uh, is the uh, cyberspace uh, in this world. Uh, if we put this cyberspace into uh, international um, politics, as you can see, uh, the state actors is the main actor. So um, in a state, it can be divided into three sectors. The first one, okay. The first one is a governmental sector, the second one is military, then the third one is civil information infrastructure. But those states can be connected to one another through so-called the global network uh, via uh, the civil information infrastructure in a state. So um, there are some uh, strategic values of cyberspace I would like to make as my proposition in order to, uh, uh, for the further discussion. The first one is uh, actually different sectors uh, in a state all share the same information infrastructure. And the second, uh, asymmetry and vulnerability of cyberspace become a second strategic value uh, in this space. Also, a non-state space uh, creates anonymity of the actors as another strategic value for states to compete to one another. Uh, there is a Chinese idiom that says, uh, wild water can carry a boat it may also capsize it. So which means uh, cyberspace offer a very convenient environment for human development. But on the other hand, this cyberspace also may create some damages for human beings as well. So that's why cyberspace becomes a very attractive target for states to compete with one another in order to dominate this cyberspace rather than just a traditional world. Um, I would like to uh, define the three major conflicts I mentioned earlier. The first one is cybercrime. Uh, we can see cybercrime as a, a, a global, um, incomprehensible phase of technology. Uh, it involves a crime related to computers. The object of offense or uh, target of a cybercrime are either the computer or the data stored in the computer. Second, uh, cyber warfare, uh, which means actions by a nation state designed to penetrate another nation's computers and networks for the purpose of causing damage or disruption. Um, as to espionage, uh, which means uh, the act of practice of obtaining secrets without the permission of the holders of the information. So uh, if we uh, take Taiwan as an example, how has Taiwan been attacked in cyberspace? Um, there are so many uh, different cyber attacks from outside of Taiwan, uh, but uh, I would like to give you some examples just happening in 2017. Uh, the first one is there were uh, massive cyber attacks on Taiwan's National Security Bureau. Uh, according to a governmental report, it is more than, uh, it is more than uh, 100,000 hacking attempts per month in general. Um, other than governmental side, uh, in, in terms of individuals, uh, there is a so-called social engineering attacks. Uh, I would like to provide you two examples uh, in my personal e experience later on. Uh, and also WannaCry is a uh, computer virus for ransom. It's also a very symbolic cyber attack in Taiwan in the previous year. The last one is also a very important and a very vital cyber attack happening in Taiwan. Uh, there is a, a banking swift server being hacked, and uh, uh, more than um, 
60 million US dollars has been lost, has been transferred to another banking account. But uh, uh, fortunately, um, Taiwanese government is able to trust back this money back to the account safely. So in the end, only 500,000 US, uh, 500, US dollars has been lost by the end. So um, therefore, uh, on the one hand, uh, I would argue Taiwan has become an attractive target. But for this reason, um, Taiwan has learned uh, uh, a lot of experience about uh, cyber defense, and uh, its defense has become more uh, sophisticated in Taiwan. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a zero day attack example. And uh, 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 from, as you can see underneath, uh, the IP address of the attacks has been traced back to a geographic location, which is also the address that received the hacked data. Uh, this is the image, uh, it's a picture I took from my computer screen when I received the email. Uh, as you can see, the sender is actually uh, JJHWNG is my name. But however, if you uh, move your cursor to uh, this, email, uh, this uh, email address, you can see the email address uh, is actually not mine. So which means uh, this email, uh, there are two hyperlinks. Uh, may contain some uh, computer virus if you click into uh, the websites. But this one is easier to uh, figure out. The next one is more sophisticated and more uh, difficult to uh, uh, notice. Uh, this is an uh, email I received last May uh, when I was doing uh, uh, organizing an international symposium in Taiwan. Uh, I am waiting for a new agenda from another organizer uh, so I can, um, uh, we can put it all together uh, by the end. So uh, I received the, uh, the email from the organizer saying, uh, Dear O, I'm sorry, uh, Dear O, a new agenda for your reference. Okay, then the organizer is author thing. Then, uh, so I didn't have any thought, just uh, open the attached file. Uh, it, is, it shows us it's a PDF file, whereas, okay. Whereas uh, this is not a PDF file, uh, it's actually a, a picture, an image contain, containing a, a computer virus. So uh, when I uh, clicked it and opened it, uh, fortunately, because I used my iPhone uh, to open it, so the, the, which is different operational system, so uh, I didn't be attacked. So I, I'm not promoting an iPhone product, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say is um, uh, actually, uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, avoid this kind of cyber attack, you have to be very careful. Okay, so um, go back to our topic, what is the state of Taiwan's cybersecurity environment? And uh, this is a World Submarine Cable System in 2017. As you can see, uh, there are so many uh, complicated cable under the sea, behind the scene in this world, connect to uh, one another in, the, in this whole world system. If we zoom into um, uh, East Asia area, as you can see, Taiwan uh, is the key position to link up with the Northeast Asia and the Southeast Asia. And also, if you look at uh, uh, the area in Asia Pacific Ocean, uh, Taiwan is also the key position to link up with uh, mainland China and the United States. So. Um, a couple years ago, uh, I think it's two decades ago, um, there, is, there was an incident in, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, the submarine cable has been damaged. So uh, the internet was uh, in a certain uh, damaged level for a couple weeks and it caused a lot of trouble and uh, economic uh, loss as well. So um, how Taiwan is going to maintain our cybersecurity environment? Uh, under the president, we have uh, several different organs to take care of uh, these issues. Uh, namely, we have uh, um, National Security Council, uh, which is responsible for making uh, policies and guidance, uh, not only for people, but also for uh, advising the president in order to uh, lead the whole country uh, in a very safe cybersecurity environment. And under uh, the executive Yuan, uh, we have uh, two units. Uh, the first one is so-called the National Information and the Communications Security Task Force. And the second one is the Ministry of National Defense. And under our MND, uh, we have a so-called cyber force 
just established in May last year, and we're still working on that uh, regarding to personnel and regarding to cyber uh, defensive capability in order to make sure the whole country uh, is under a certain protection. Uh, I would like to draw your attention on the so-called NICST, uh, this is task force, because uh, I would argue actually this task force is a, uh, play a very important role. Under uh, this task force, we have uh, several different systems. The first one uh, is a cyberspace protecting system and also cybercrime investigation system and also critical infrastructure protection system as well. Uh, other than that, we have uh, some other cybersecurity issues we have to deal with. So um, this task force plays a very vital role to coordinate with uh, different governmental sectors, such as military sectors, and also uh, uh, coordinate with uh, uh, private sectors as well. And in terms of level of cybersecurity environment in Taiwan, uh, we divide it into three different levels. The top one is a nascent security level, and the lower one is individual uh, security. For the uh, top one, uh, the main goal is to maintain a national integration and uh, to make sure classified, classified document has been protected. And for individual security level, I think the main goal is to protect the privacy and the data protection for individuals. Uh, this slide, I would like to show you example of how Taiwan is going to protect the cybersecurity environment. Uh, this is a, a so-called strategy uh, called the depth of defense in cyberspace. As you can see, uh, this diagram divided into three layers. The top layer uh, is so-called intranet in Taiwan, and the lower layer uh, is uh, the internet compared to the whole global network. Uh, so we create so-called honey pots and uh, honey nets in order to attract uh, hackers to attack these fake sites so that we can buy some time uh, for uh, intranet to uh, make a very good protection. We also create a buffer as a, a DMZ zone so that when uh, attacks happening, uh, we have uh, some uh, time to uh, make a reaction as well. Uh, by the end, I would like to uh, use SWAT uh, to analyze Taiwan's cybersecurity environment. Strength. Uh, Taiwan has improved uh, prepa preparedness after completing the four-phase national information and communication security mechanism plan. Under this plan, Taiwan has raised level of cybersecurity governance to establish the national security defense mechanism, in which uh, we also established the, the Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Management Group, and also the Industry Development Group under the NICST. So uh, Taiwan have constructed the legal basis for cybercrime by proactively promoting the legislation of the Information Security Management Act. Weakness. Uh, we still have some problematic issues we have to deal with. The first one is the absence of specific policy, defensive um, ben benchmark, benchmark, and also management uh, paradigm on the critical information infrastructure. Second, I think uh, the lack of a thorough training program for cybersecurity specialists, we still have to work on that. And uh, the lack of information cooperation due to practical issues, I think that's also a very key uh, problem for us. That's why I'm here. And opportunity. I think uh, uh, in Taiwan, uh, the cooperation of private industries and academia and also the government, the government creates a demand for cybersecurity specialists. And uh, the exceptional circumstances of Taiwan's national cybersecurity can attract other states to cooperate with, with Taiwan. Threat. Uh, the so-called APT attacks and uh, the organized crime hackers are still threatening to hack the classified information from the government and the business as well. So uh, the frequency and the scale of a denial of services attack uh, in Taiwan are at a record high in 2017. So uh, the risk of critical information infrastructure being invaded has increased. Uh, other than that, the rapid development of IOTs uh, stands for Internet, Internet of Things, and other information technology has increased the threat 
both virtually and physically. Uh, there are some points I would like to make as my conclusion. First, uh, the targets of attacks in Taiwan have changed from what is vulnerable to what is valuable. I think that will be very different to uh, what we, th we can imagine before. Second, the defensive integration of the government, military, and the civil, civil sectors is, ve is very important for us in order to build up a robust a cyber defensive shield for the entire country. However, um, we still uh, have to face some challenges, mainly is the lack of trust, like uh, uh, the trust between the government and the private sectors. I think that's a general issue we have to deal with for uh, all states. So uh, I would like to promote a domestic cooperation as a good solution, such as public-private partnerships. The last, but uh, the, not the least, uh, Taiwan must build and maintain robust strategic partnerships in cyberspace internationally to deter shared threats and increase international security and stability. Thank you for your listening. Fantastic to get to hear your perspective. You know, Taiwan has been dealing with cybersecurity threats for a long time and is in a very strategically important position. And I think that we have a lot to learn from Taiwan's experience in this area. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that you highlight that the, the risk um, is increasing. I would highlight that even, even this week, we're learning about new challenges um, that are making the risk, the threat environment, even more complex. Mm -hmm. So cooperation um, and, and really engaging on these issues is going to be even more important than ever. We just learned about a new chip vulnerability, for instance, in which virtually all modern devices are going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, this is the meltdown and, and specter news that was announced uh, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. So this is something, and particularly when it comes to nations states and nation states having the capabilities to take advantage of these kinds of vulnerabilities, um, Taiwan is going to be very important for, for handling that. Um, and this year in 2018, the environment, not just in Taiwan, but internationally, is becoming more complicated. Um, as you mentioned, there's, um, there's an election cycle beginning in 2018, mm -hmm. and I think that Taiwan could potentially be vulnerable um, to election interference. Um, in a way that's going to create some new risks as well. So both inside Taiwan and internationally, we're looking at a, a rising risk environment um, and at a time when Taiwan's readiness to handle these threats is going to be more important than ever. So I wanted to, to focus on three areas um, from your presentation in particular, highlight some of my key takeaways and some areas that I'm going to be watching this year. You pointed out in cyberspace that we should think about cyberspace in sort of three broad categories. Mm -hmm. So government and political leadership, military, um, and the civilian, the civilian area. So within the, in the government space, um, it seems like Taiwan has made, some, has made some changes recently in the political bureaucracy around mm -hmm. cyberspace mm -hmm. um, and the creation of the NICST. Um, Taiwan is not alone in this. I think globally we've seen governments around the world begin to think about how can we better um, streamline resources um, to be able to centralize and put and elevate the position of cybersecurity so that governments are more able to meet the threat. Um, so one question that I, that I have for you is if we're thinking about NICST, um, what observations do you have initially in terms of how successful the creation of that institution has been into um, to putting more government resources and sort of streamlining the political effort behind cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Any initial observations? Um, what roles has this agency taken on that have been particularly impactful? So that's one of my, my first question, I think, on the political leadership side. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, so uh, for this question, uh, thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, that's a very uh, wonderful question as well. So uh, that will be uh, let me to uh, elaborate more information regarding to uh, Taiwan's cybersecurity environment. Uh, of course, uh, NICST uh, is a very vital uh, organization for Taiwan because, as you as we all know, Taiwan has been a uh, democratic country. So uh, we are not uh, be able to uh, force uh, our private sector to do this to do that. So uh, <laughs> uh, because we are not an authoritarian regime. So uh, so. Um, 
more or less, I think uh, um, this organization plays a very important role to coordinate with the different sectors, as I mentioned earlier in my slides. Uh, most, most importantly is um, because uh, we create a so-called cyber force uh, last May, and uh, uh, like I said, we're still working on that. But uh, that's on the military sector side. Uh, so in the governmental side, I think we, we needed to have a, an organization like this to uh, coordinate with a private sector such as our telecommunication company, is so-called uh, uh, CT, uh, CTC, Chinese Telecommunication uh, Company. Uh, as we all know, we have uh, our own national telecommunication company like uh, uh, when I was in the UK, it's called BT, British uh, Telecommunication Company. And uh, when I went to uh, Korea, it's called KT, a Korean uh, telecommunication company as well. So I think uh, uh, this telecommunication company plays a very important role to build up a cable system and uh, uh, build up an entire uh, cyberspace uh, for uh, Taiwan as example. So um, uh, this task force, um, we, uh, we organize uh, some training program and also to uh, organize some uh, cooperative uh, events with other sectors. So uh, if I go back to uh, your question, uh, you mentioned about uh, the election uh, mm -hmm. in 2018 this year. Uh, I think um, more or less, I, uh, I feel like a, a training program is very important not only for governmental officials, but also for our citizens as well. So I think uh, how we can uh, make sure uh, everyone is uh, uh, under the very good understanding about uh, to protect not only their individual uh, uh, privacy, but also uh, entire uh, cyberspace for a country. So uh, overall, I would like to uh, answer your question. Uh, that, that is uh, this so-called uh, uh, task force, uh, it, I think is uh, still ongoing. Uh, because uh, like I said, uh, how we can uh, narrow down the gap between the sectors and how we can build up the trust uh, between the different sectors. I think that's uh, uh, the way we have to work on. And critical infrastructure is another important focus. And you exactly. mentioned it as an area of weakness. And I would yeah. actually argue that Taiwan is really not alone in this. And I think globally, um, governments around the world mm -hmm. are, are, are struggling to keep up with the risk specifically to critical information infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is an area where this is, I, I would argue, critical information infrastructure is the new risk frontier for mm -hmm. cyber. And it's the one where the consequences are the gravest of an attack um, because you're dealing with human life, you're dealing with safety, you're dealing with the environment, national security. But it is the area where Taiwan is not alone in having this weakness. I think the US, um, as well, is trying to catch up with the new risks posed to critical infrastructure in particular. Um, and on that front, we've seen you know, in the US and in China as well, um, an effort to build out new policies and best practices around critical infrastructure. And there's a debate that's going on in China, for example, about when, we're, when it comes to policies and crit critical infrastructure, should this be more of a regulatory or a voluntary type of policy approach? Um, and when there's a voluntary system, the idea is that companies adhere to best practices and use standards rather than a sort of rules regulatory based system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wanted to ask in the Taiwan model, um, what are the incentives for the private sector and for companies in critical infrastructure to enforce best practices when it comes to cybersecurity? Is this more regulatory? Is it more voluntary? Um, just what, you know, what is that, how is that shaping up to be? Um, thank you. Uh, uh, for this question, in my humble opinion, I feel like, uh, because as you know, a a Taiwanese government has transferred uh, from uh, one generation to another. So uh, in terms of our um, telecommunication company, like I mentioned earlier, uh, is actually, uh, was actually owned by the government in the very beginning. So uh, more or less, it's a very, in a very good connection between uh, the government and this company. Uh, but however, uh, I would say uh, that the key problem for us is uh, because uh, this company is so big, so there are so many um, tasks they have to they have no choice but to like uh, outsourcing to other uh, subcontract uh, companies. So I think we have to focus on uh, these uh, sub small companies to make sure whether or not uh, they are uh, in the same page uh, with the government in order to protect uh, protect the cyber space for Taiwan. And also uh, 
uh, like you mentioned earlier, I think that's true because information infrastructure is more important. Uh, uh, I'm not saying it's more important than others, but it's very important. For example, um, like uh, uh, when I, uh, last year in November, I visit uh, Estonia uh, for uh, their e-governments. And uh, uh, I was told, um, actually, uh, nowadays people uh, only focus on the security of information rather than uh, the infrastructure bearing the information. Mm. You see what I mean? So, um, so I think we have to put these two uh, areas together. Uh, on the one hand, we have to make sure uh, our information is secured. But on the other hand, we have to make sure the information has been delivered safely. Mm. So uh, I think uh, uh, overall in Taiwan, um, we are aware of uh, this issue and uh, we work on that. And uh, uh, I would say so far so good. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, we still have uh, some uh, weakness and uh, um, uh, threats, we needed to work on that. Yeah, and I think critical infrastructure is particularly challenging because here you're dealing with something called um, operating technology. Mm -hmm. And this is you know, systems that um, are now increasingly integrated in information technology systems. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the technologies, the approaches, the, the, the skills involved in protecting operating technology is very different from information technology. Mm -hmm. And so Taiwan is certainly not alone in trying to figure out how to meet that challenge. You. you mentioned before the, the human factor mm -hmm. and lack of training being another area that's a challenge for mm -hmm. Taiwan. I think that it's a really important observation because many times people are focused on the technology solutions in cybersecurity when human, the human factor arguably is a much greater risk, whether you're talking about human error or malicious intent. Mm -hmm. This is where much of the risk from cyber, the cyber front comes from. So it will definitely be important for Taiwan to think yeah. about training mm -hmm. um, and, and workforce development in that area. I yeah. did want to ask, I'm interested in your recent visit to Estonia. Mm -hmm. For those of us in the cybersecurity field, I think we're all very interested in Estonia um, mm -hmm. as, as a model of a country that's really been at the forefront of leading cybersecurity efforts. And I was wondering if there were any observations or takeaways from your visit um, with Estonia, their experience with e-government that you think are applicable that you've wanted to take back to Taiwan? Okay. Yeah, um, that's, that, uh, that's a wonderful question because um, in Taiwan, we also work on uh, so-called e-identification uh, uh, for a long time. And uh, um, Estonia case is a uh, very good example for us to follow on. Uh, when I visited uh, Estonia and uh, I was told uh, for Estonian people uh, in their entire life, only three times they have to deal with matters with the government in person. The first one is uh, get married. And the second one is uh, get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> and the third one uh, is uh, buy a house, buy a property. I don't know why. But, uh, uh, and other than that, they, they, they can deal with the matters online. Uh, so without any uh, effort to deal with uh, something in person with the government, the governmental officials. Um, but uh, I think uh, why um, they are so, uh, uh, so I would say, uh, so advanced about this system, that's because uh, uh, the trust. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, the, the Estonian government over or uh, over generate a very safe environment for people to deliver their information and uh, to protect their uh, private uh, uh, data uh, safely, so so that the people are willing to deal with matters online with the government rather than uh, in person. So I think uh, if we go back to Taiwan's case. I feel like uh, that's also the key point. Taiwan has has to work on that. Uh, that's how to uh, win or how to earn the trust from people, uh, not only for uh, other political issues, but also uh, in uh, in the matter in cyberspace. But I think that's uh, this uh, lack of trust is a general uh, quite a problem for uh, many countries as well. So um, uh, I would like to say, for example, uh, technically speaking. Uh, Estonian system, they build up a so-called X road, uh, which means it's a very, very safe road for people to deliver their personal information and for government to deliver uh, some documents uh, in this so-called X, X road. So I think uh, uh, from technical perspective, I think uh, uh, Taiwan has a uh, this such a very advanced IT capability but uh, uh, for like a human factor you mentioned earlier, we needed to uh, make sure everything is under a certain uh, secured level. I think that's the, uh, the case. Yeah. Great. Um, one last question and then I'll open it up to uh, the audience. Um, you mentioned the, 
the new unit that's been created in the military, mm -hmm. focused specifically on cybersecurity, and China as well has the strategic support forces, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. So we are seeing a trend in terms of military um, devoting resources to focusing specifically on cybersecurity and setting up cyber commands. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little bit of a, um, an understanding about how this, this fourth unit works and maybe any observations comparing it with China's strategic support forces? Okay. Um, uh, this is a, a very a good question as well. Um, from what I understand about China's uh, military reform, as we all know, uh, they transfer their uh, cyber capability from uh, different units in uh, so-called seven military regimes uh, uh, a long time ago to a so-called strategic support force. Uh, I have to say uh, that's a very smart way to uh, build up uh, this so-called strategic support force. That, that is because uh, to make sure and uh, to define uh, cyber warfare is a uh, important warfare compared with other traditional warfares. So, uh, but it's in different way to support the traditional uh, military operations. Um, if we go back to uh, Taiwanese side, um, I think uh, because uh, before the current DPP government took over uh, the, the brain, um, they uh, already published a so-called print, uh, a, blue, uh, a blue paper uh, regarding to how to build up a so-called cyber force in order to maintain and uh, make sure that the whole country is, is in under a certain uh, protection in cyberspace. So um, that will be similar to, um, as you all know, a cyber command in the United States has been uh, established since uh, 2007, 2007, I think, yeah, if, if I'm right. So, um, so uh, I think that Taiwanese cyber force is still a uh, uh, focus on, first of all, is how to build up uh, enough personnel in order to make sure the whole uh, task uh, is able to be conducted safely. Uh, second is uh, to build up uh, um, uh, a lot of training program uh, to make sure uh, this personnel uh, is under a very good uh, um, uh, condition. So um, uh, right now, as you may know uh, from the newspaper a few days ago, uh, the commanding officers of the Cyber Force has been just promoted to two-star general. And uh, uh, we're still working on how to expand the personnel for the, uh, for the Cyber Force. And uh, 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 so uh, I have to say that this Cyber Force is still new and uh, still uh, a lot of things to, to be constructed. So, um, uh, but uh, I think that's a trend uh, in this world. It's not only for Taiwan, for China, or for the United States. Uh, is, is for, uh, for example, like a, a few months ago, uh, NATO also uh, make an announcement uh, to say they are going to build up a, a so-called cyber command uh, rather than only cyber defense uh, research center. So um, I think uh, this is a, a trend in this uh, world because uh, we have to face the cybersecurity uh, seriously, not only just uh, in our daily life, but also uh, for the national security matter. And this could also be an important touch point as we're thinking about um, expanding international cooperation. Mm -hmm. This becomes a really important um, focal point for some of these efforts to do more exchanges and participate in sort of hacking drills and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, anyway, I, that, that's enough from me, but I wanted to give back to Chris. And, yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, just a couple things that I also noticed. Uh, first, uh, you know, obviously in my government career, I had a lot of interactions with your national security agencies. We've certainly had some challenges with that in our system. How does how do the different bureaucracies unite on mm -hmm. this issue? Um, your sense of sort of from your graphic there, we had the National Security Bureau, of course. One presumes the uh, MJIB is involved in some way or another. Mm -hmm. The military. How do you see that coming together? And and from your perspective, uh, do you see the current government as perhaps being more focused on that than previous governments? Or you mentioned they had sort of a, a roadmap before they even came into office. Are you mm -hmm. seeing that um, sort of being played out throughout Taiwan's system? Uh, in my humble opinion, and according to my observation, I feel like uh, the current Chinese government, they focus on this issue uh, more uh, carefully than before. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because uh, not only the different government, but I would argue that's because uh, the matter of cybersecurity becomes more important and it becomes more obvious than before. Uh, when um, uh, a lot of uh, cyber attacks happening in Taiwan, uh, like I mentioned in my slides earlier, uh, especially for economic perspective, uh, there are a lot of money lost mm -hmm. uh, just due to the cyber attacks. I think uh, overall, that this 
events and these attacks uh, make the government to not only realize but also to uh, work on these issues so heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, 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 you are right because from my standing point, I, I think uh, Taiwan is in a, a, a very right direction mm -hmm. uh, for build up a so-called cyber uh, security environment for uh, the state. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something that really jumped out at me in your slides was this uh, notion, but you didn't really explain it, so I'll ask mm -hmm. you to do so now, of the move from the vulnerable to the valuable mm -hmm. in terms of the focus of attacks, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and can you sort of map out for us both the timeline of how you see that as having happened and what you know, Taiwan's government and your own analysis uh, seems to be the focus of that uh, attention? Is it because the adversary's capabilities are improving and their confidence therefore is improving? Um, is it because your own security is getting better and therefore there's not as much vulnerable, uh, but there is still a lot valuable? How do you see that um, equation? Okay, uh, uh, this argument I made, uh, why uh, the, uh, the attack is being shipped from what is vulnerable to what is valuable, that's because uh, two sides. The first one is uh, for Taiwan, as you mentioned earlier, um, because uh, Taiwan is cyber, uh, a defense capability has been stronger than before, so uh, maybe uh, so uh, uh, that's the case for them to attack the, the valuable one. But I would argue from other side, it's outside of Taiwan, from the uh, attack side, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, nowadays uh, when we, uh, I mean, um, why I make this argument, that's because uh, in the recent cyber attacks in Taiwan, um, uh, in the very beginning, they all uh, focus on a vulnerable place in order to penetrate mm -hmm. to this uh, so-called cyberspace mm -hmm. uh, for a state. But uh, uh, I would argue uh, that be why they shift from um, vulnerable one to valuable one, that's because uh, the attack is, I mean the scale of attack is bigger than before. Mm -hmm. It's more organized, it's more um, skilled, so um, they don't want to waste time to attack the vulnerable ones, but right. uh, valuable ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, so I would uh, say um, uh, the level of cyber attack has been uh, shifted mm -hmm. uh, to an uh, upper level mm -hmm. uh, from maybe individual ones to uh, organizational ones. Yeah, right. That's the, the case. And then um, we sort of glanced across the China's development of the strategic support force. I know you've just put out a paper on mm -hmm. this. Um, what is your sense of how well they're doing, if you will, in terms of transferring those capabilities to this new centralized organization? Is it your sense that it's a pretty dedicated effort? I think that's the general consensus. Um, and how do you see their marrying of the cyber uh, capability with their uh, space capability underneath that same umbrella? Do you see that as a powerful combination uh, and something we all should be concerned about? Okay, um, fairly speaking, um I feel like uh, 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 any cyber force for a state uh, is a dual use. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, it's for uh, cyber defense, but on the other hand, it's for cyber offensive uh, capability. So um, uh, strategic support force in China, like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I would say it's a very smart move uh, from the previous one to the new one. Uh, but the problem is uh, how the capability of this so-called cyber strategic support force is able to promote a good performance, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we have to observe. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues uh, saying uh, Chinese military reform uh, is a very valuable uh, research topic. Uh, we can uh, working on that for more than 10 years. <laughs> so I think uh, it's an ongoing project. Uh, for example, I would like to uh, uh, offer you some uh, comments I earned from uh, reviewers for uh, my papers, because uh, the majority uh, comments is saying uh, that this is ongoing event. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are still a lack of information we needed to uh, obtain. So, um, but overall, I would say, uh, uh, like I said, fairly speaking, uh, for a state, cyber force is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only for China, not only for Taiwan, but also like for Japan and Korea, and also uh, for, like, like I said, the NATO. Uh, uh, so uh, compared with the traditional uh, warfare, uh, as we all, we all know, uh, in terms of military uh, expense, the gap between Taiwan and the mainland China is in a very huge certain level. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, uh, in terms of cyber capability, it's just another direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like additional. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, 
uh, I would uh, see uh, it's a normal um, case, but uh, uh, watch, watch it the carefully. Space. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Um, and then, of course, here at CSIS, one of our focuses is on policy solutions to these challenging problems, um, especially, obviously, from a U.S. perspective. We haven't really talked about that in your discussion, but how do you see U.S.-Taiwan cooperation um, mm -hmm. playing in this space? One thing that struck me as interesting is it sounds like Taiwan has some similar issues with trust issues between mm -hmm. the private sector and, yeah, and yeah. the public sector. Um, do you see that as a possible area of cooperation? And just in general, what could the U.S. be doing to, to be more helpful? Also within the context, of course, though, of concerns about Taiwan's vulnerability uh, mm -hmm. in this space. Okay, um, I think that's a very good question because, uh, as we all know, um, American national security strategy just released a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in that strategy, uh, talking about how to cooperate with other countries in different uh, security matters. And I think uh, because, uh, inevitably speaking, uh, there are some political issues we have to deal with. But however, I think cyberspace is different to a geographic world. So uh, we have to cyberspace differently. Uh, we cannot use international um, politics to look at this virtual world. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of cooperation between Taiwan and the United States, uh, I, personally, I would argue uh, we have to not forget, but kind of like uh, uh, keep on side uh, about the political issues, mm -hmm. uh, only, only focus on how to cooperate with one another, one another in order to make a secured cyberspace for human beings. So uh, in reality, I would say, for example, like uh, uh, CSIs or some non-governmental uh, sector is, uh, uh, can play a very important role uh, in order to promote the cooperation in the future uh, for uh, both countries in these issues. I think that, that will be the case first. Okay, um, the audience has been very patient, so we're now gonna turn to them uh, for some questions. Uh, as usual, if you would please uh, identify yourself and do limit your question to a question, if you can. Thank you very much. Um, floor is open. In the back there, Russell. Thank you, Chris. Um, Russell Shell with the Global Taiwan Institute, and thank you for a, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Um, I have a question, uh, and thank you for a very timely conference, and timely not because of the pervasiveness of this issue, which is certainly the case, but timely because, uh, based on my understanding, um, the Department of Homeland Security organizes a biennial exercise called CyberStorm, and it's supposed to be scheduled, I think, uh, for the spring of this year, so 2018. And, um, and the focus of this year's exercise uh, is supposed to be on critical manufacturing and transportation sector. So I found your remark concerning the, um, the shift from a focus of vulnerable to valuable uh, aspects of uh, cyber attacks on or cyber hacking um, relevant in that way. And so could you perhaps tell us about what Taiwan is doing with regards to securing its critical manufacturing and transportation sector and, uh, and, and how in what ways do you think Taiwan could contribute to the purpose of these exercises? So uh, some context, CyberStorm has uh, been held biannually as international participants. Um, and, um, and, and I think you know, perhaps Taiwan would like to join that if they could. So could you perhaps tell, you know, um, share with us uh, what Taiwan could contribute to these exercises? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think, uh, the cooperation between two states. Uh, you mentioned a cyber storm. I think that's a very military oriented uh, exercise. Uh, safely speaking, uh, I don't think uh, that will be a very, um, uh, well, I, I mean, we cannot put, a, uh, put this cyber storm as a first priority. Uh, rather than that, I would uh, propose another uh, cooperation uh, that's uh, from the educational purpose. So, uh, for example, and like I mentioned uh, in my slides earlier, I think a training program, uh, I think it's a very good uh, opportunity for us to cooperate with one another. Uh, for example, because uh, in Taiwan, uh, according to the uh, IT capability in Taiwan, I'm not bluffing, but uh, uh, the, the capability is really good. So uh, how we are able to share what we have, uh, such as uh, the patterns of cyber attacks or uh, the skills of uh, cyber defense, and also uh, to uh, have a more uh, practice on educational purpose. So I think uh, in that regard, I think uh, we can conduct a further cooperation uh, for both sides, rather than jump into a, a so-called cyberstorm military exercise. 
uh, that that's uh, from my uh, very humble po po opinion. Yeah. Sir, in the corner. Um, hi, Jeff Hahn. I'm with Stratfor. Uh, I had a question for you regarding the structure of cyber defense. Private enterprises are increasingly, like you said, being targeted for their intellectual property or for extortion, targeting the valuable rather than the vulnerable. Do you think that it's possible to secure that data, or should they operate under the assumption, not, not just in Taiwan but globally, that any information stored digitally will at some point be exploited, copied, or stolen? Uh, this is a very technical uh, question. Uh, I would say uh, uh, nothing is safe in cyberspace, okay? And, uh, uh, but nothing is uh, not possible to make it safe. So um, uh, on the one hand, we have to uh, always have a backup plan, uh, backup data as well. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we cannot uh, see uh, this cyberspace as a very dangerous place so that we don't do anything on it. So um, uh, for example, uh, for everyone, uh, we all deal with the documents, data online and uh, on the cloud as well. But uh, we all know we have to uh, have a backup data uh, somewhere else. Uh, we cannot put the OX in the same basket. So um, uh, I think uh, answer your question, simply speaking, yes, uh, there's no any information will be 100% uh, safe uh, in cyberspace uh, when you store uh, your data uh, online or on computers. Uh, but some people might argue uh, uh, my computer doesn't connect to any uh, internet or cyberspace. Maybe uh, that would be safe. Uh, that's the case. So, uh, but uh, nowadays, for example, I just bought a, a new uh, laptop, um, uh, Mac Air Pro, uh, and uh, there's no any uh, USB uh, plug-in USB uh, devices on it, which means uh, uh, in the current digital age, uh, we all do things online on the cloud. So. Um, so um, my answer will be uh, just make sure everything uh, will be uh, backed up. <laughs> <laughs> and just to follow up on that, uh, you mentioned earlier Taiwan's sort of centralized telecommunications company and, mm -hmm. and system, and you seem to suggest that's a good model, um, say in comparison to a more decentralized model. Um, but isn't that also sort of a single point of vulnerability mm -hmm. in this context that you just discussed? So how do you see that challenge? Uh, you mean? The in other words, with one massive telecommunications mm -hmm. infrastructure, mm -hmm. that's one point of failure. Yeah, um, yeah. And so do you believe that that's a better model? I mean, and it has pluses and minuses, doesn't it, to have um, the telecommunications infrastructure so centralized? OK. Um, <coughs> um, in Taiwan, uh, because, um, like I said, uh, uh, a lot of like banking system and uh, transportation system and also a power supply system, we all rely on computer system. Mm -hmm. So uh, overall, uh, this all uh, uh, communication system together is a so-called information infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, in my point of view, I feel like uh, uh, when we centralize uh, this uh, communication uh, system together, uh, we have to, uh, that's why I, I offer you a, a strategy so-called depth of cyber uh, defense mm -hmm. uh, in cyberspace. So um, uh, when we centralize this communication system together, I think uh, we have to uh, build up an uh, even better uh, protection system on it. So um, uh, overall, uh, I don't see that that will be the problem for us, mm -hmm. but uh, um, we have to be very careful for further development. Sure, yeah. okay. Um, Scott. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, Estonia. <laughs> uh, be, uh, the question's not about Estonia, but it's a good place to start, simply because uh, it's very, uh, Taiwan's in a very similar situation, right? You have a small country next to a very large country with which it has a complex relationship. Uh, and hence, Estonia has invested a great deal in protecting uh, cyber. Um, you haven't touched upon this much yet, but and maybe it just the answer is so obvious uh, that it doesn't bear worth asking, but uh, in terms of threats to Taiwan, 
what proportion of that threat comes from mainland China? Is this essentially about cross-strait relations and as cross-strait relations go up and go down, hot and cold, the threats to Taiwan's cybersecurity environment go up and down as well. And um, you showed a slide that uh, I believe uh, showed most of the intrusions were from Hubei. You showed that one case. Uh, so is, is this basically about China or is Taiwan vulnerable to many other different types of threats? And what are the Chinese most interested in? Uh, government agencies, uh, large corporations, finance, uh, critical infrastructure. Um, so just sort of, if you could put this conversation in the context of cross-strait relations, that'd be really helpful. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, that's a very tough question for me. Um, but uh, I would like to offer you, offer you my very personal uh, uh, point of view. That is, um, Technically speaking, uh, we can trace back to uh, a geographical location where uh, cyber attacks conduct, like I mentioned, uh, like I showed you uh, in my slides earlier. Um, in terms of uh, how many attacks are from mainland China, I think uh, according to the report just released by our government uh, last year, um, the majority attacks is from mainland China. And, uh, um, has been increased in the last year when the government has been transferred from previous one to the new one. So uh, obviously, uh, even though Taiwan and the mainland China, we have a, a very good uh, interaction in different perspectives, such as educational perspective, cultural as perspective, but we still in a, a so-called political confrontation, not to mention uh, military confrontation. So. Uh, I would uh, be not surprised. Uh, there are many cyber attacks from mainland China. I think uh, most of you will assume that as well. But the problem is um, how we are able to argue those attacks are sponsored by the government, not by individuals. I think that, that will be the case, and that will be the difficulty for us to uh, um, figure it out. So, um, so uh, why I mentioned uh, from the wrong uh, uh, the target has been shifted from uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerable one to the valuable one. That's because uh, we noticed that the attack has been uh, more organized and more um, bigger than before. It's not only by uh, very general uh, individuals, but also uh, organized a uh, group. So uh, that's the case. We have to uh, see that very uh, carefully. Uh, if we go back to the context of uh, cross-strait relations, I feel like, uh, uh, like I said, in terms of uh, military capability uh, for both sides, uh, it's no doubt um, the difference is huge, uh, as we all know. Uh, but if we go back to cyberspace, I think uh, that's why um, lately uh, Chinese government is going to claim their so-called cyber sovereignty. Uh, and uh, I think that will be uh, very important for a state uh, to defend their country in cyberspace in the future uh, as a uh, legal basis. So uh, uh, I think that that's also another question I would like to uh, remind you is uh, because we see cyberspace differently. Um, for example, like, uh, like Taiwan, uh, we see cyberspace as a convenient uh, space for human development. But uh, if we see cyberspace as a uh, uh, power and uh, as a uh, sovereignty to claim uh, in order to uh, pursue uh, the political goals, I think that, that will be a different case. Mm. So uh, go back to your question. Um, I think uh, we all, uh, even though it's not obvious, but uh, we, we understand that the massive cyber attacks from mainland China is inevitable. Lady in the green there. 
Hi, I'm Lara Danielson with the U.S. Taiwan Business Council. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the role that Taiwan companies can play in Taiwan's cybersecurity environment. How do you see that? Do they see them as a vulnerability, as a strength? And I'm particularly thinking about the indigenous defense industry development in Taiwan, where smaller uh, Taiwan companies are being brought into the defense supply chain. Thank you. Uh, what kind of role Taiwan can play? Um, I think that's, also, that's the same question I always ask when I attend uh, several different conferences. So uh, today I'm, I've been asked the same question. <laughs> uh, I think that Taiwan can play a very important role. Uh, regardless, uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, I would say Taiwan might not be uh, the member of the UN, but uh, Taiwan has been recognized politically in this world. Uh, not to mention uh, uh, the IT capability in cyberspace. So um, uh, I think Taiwan uh, has to uh, not only maintain, but also uh, build up a new so-called strategic value uh, in cyberspace in order to uh, make a very good partnership with other states. So uh, geographic speaking, uh, like I show you the, uh, the cable system under the sea, even though the cyberspace is virtual, but uh, the connection between this space and the real uh, physical world is uh, still behind the scene. So uh, um, t uh, how Taiwan can uh, uh, provide a good uh, a defensive capability uh, for the uh, regional security issue, not only in real world, but uh, in uh, virtual world. I think uh, uh, that's why, that's how Taiwan uh, can play. So, uh, if we go back to the topic I mentioned today, Taiwan cybersecurity environment, I think by the end, like I mentioned, uh, Taiwan has to uh, build up a, uh, a cooperation and uh, share the uh, threats internationally. So uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, after this conference, uh, maybe we can talk about how we proceed the further cooperation uh, between the United States and Taiwan in this, uh, in this regard. So uh, that's basically uh, the opinion I would like to offer. Yeah. And just to sort of zero in on the question uh, um, a little more, the, the role of Taiwanese private companies, I mean, obviously there's a strong infrastructure that exists mm -hmm. there. It's, it's being promoted heavily by the current government. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that as, uh, as a strength, and, and how do you see that? Uh, the defense integration question is an interesting one, because obviously, as more companies play a role in that, just like we've learned here with subcontractors and problems mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. uh, they become vulnerable to attacks as well. So you're thinking on it? Uh, uh, I think that in terms of uh, the private companies, I, um, uh, I feel like this is a big issue for us, because um, uh, nowadays, uh, our cur the current government in Taiwan, uh, we realize uh, this issue and uh, this problem, but uh, uh, we're still working on how to uh, make sure everything is okay. For example, like, uh, um, when I traveled to Italy, uh, I wanted to buy a, a coffee machine, uh, and uh, my Italian friend told me, you have to buy a machine made in Italy, not in China. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I couldn't find it uh, at the end. <laughs> I, I bought a, a, a coffee machine made in India <laughs> instead. So uh, uh, nowadays in Taiwan, uh, so many products has been, uh, you know, uh, inevitably made by, uh, made by China. So uh, especially for IT product. Um, uh, uh, so in terms of IT devices and the companies, um, I think, um, uh, why I mention integration uh, of different sectors, that's because I think our government, like uh, the task force, has to be a leading position mm. to not only provide the president a very good advice, but also to, to uh, put all uh, private sectors together to have a, a, a not only common sense, but also an uh, uh, agreement. Uh, on the one hand, we have to uh, build up uh, our own strength uh, by, uh, from the uh, private uh, companies. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, uh, government has to uh, provide uh, some benefits mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, put them all together. Um, I'm sorry, I have, I have to say uh, this is a very uh, tough issue uh, for us to deal with. Sure. And uh, uh, especially when we talk about uh, the lack of trust between government and the private sector, uh, uh, that, that will be the the first priority uh, problem we have to deal with. Yeah, it's well, so a tough issue for us here <laughs> too. So, <laughs> okay.
Uh, Jeff, Bing. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jeff Beam with CSIS. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Huang. I wanted to follow up on something that uh, uh, Ms. Sachs raised earlier, which is uh, we tend to focus heavily in cybersecurity in the field on software-related problems, yet we've seen in the news in the last 48 to 72 hours uh, the issues that can arise with hardware vulnerabilities. If we walk down the street to a local elect electronics store here in the United States, we looked at computer components. A number of them have been manufactured or developed in Taiwan, uh, companies like MSI and, and ASUS. I'm wondering, um, to push you again a little bit on the, the private sector side of things, uh, to what extent do you think the planning or the thinking is in place to uh, start finding solutions for hardware level vulnerabilities? Because as we saw in the news, you have uh, one of the most trusted companies in the United States, Intel, has been developing processors for the last 10 years that have a hardware level vulnerability. Obviously, Taiwan has a lot of expertise in this area uh, in the private sector. I just wanted your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the vulnerability uh, of hardware, um, I think uh, my understanding is um, if we uh, see this problem as a key issue for us, uh, how we are going to avoid it? Um, in general, uh, I would say uh, the Western world, like a Western country, especially like the United States, is still uh, dominate uh, this cyberspace in terms of uh, hardware, in terms of software. Uh, uh, like uh, all of us, we all use uh, software operational systems uh, invented by American companies, not a, a, a Chinese company or Taiwanese companies. Uh, but in terms of hardware, I think uh, uh, there is another uh, approach or another area we can cooperate with one another. Uh, so uh, that's why um, uh, we would like to shift our uh, IT industry from uh, mainland China to uh, the United States, take uh, uh, the company as an example. But uh, um, I think I'm not uh, very uh, familiar with the details, but I have to say, uh, uh, if we wanted to get rid of uh, this difficulty, we have to have uh, our own new product and uh, uh, our own uh, hardware made by ourselves. But uh, it's not very easy because uh, uh, the, the, the capacity of the whole industry is not uh, that big. So um, how we are going to work with others uh, safely, uh, I think that, that's the issue we have to deal with. And just to tag on to that question briefly, mm -hmm. how is Taiwan thinking about sort of the evolution of 5G in particular preparing for, for example, if we have Huawei playing an increasingly dominant role in mm -hmm. 5G standards and, and infrastructure globally, what will that mean for Taiwan and how is Taiwan thinking about the next generation of internet? Okay, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting question because uh, uh, when I uh, traveled to uh, Korea uh, a few months ago, uh, they are also built up the, the 5G. Uh, honestly, I would say Taiwan is a bit uh, too late for uh, this development, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not too late. <laughs> uh, it's late, but not too late. So, um, because in, uh, if we go back to technical perspective, uh, the, the Wi-Fi, uh, uh, they, they, the format of the Wi-Fi uh, protocol uh, I think uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's technology is very advanced for, for it. So um, uh, it's not only about a, a fifth generation, uh, so-called 5G, but also it's about how to build up a secure, secured protocol for, uh, uh, for this generation to transfer information uh, wireless from one side to another. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think uh, from what I understand uh, in Taiwan, uh, we have a, a very good uh, capability for building up a good uh, uh, so-called protocol uh, technology uh, in this regard. So um, uh, I don't want to go to very detail about technology, like uh, seven layers or something like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I, I'm trying to say is uh, the five G is a very good is a very good opportunity for Taiwan to. Uh, to build up a uh, uh, good capability in the next generation uh, in cyberspace. And I believe we had a question up front here. Yep.
Welcome back to DC, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Horn. My name is Takahiro Motegi, visiting yeah. fellow at CSA Japan Chair. So it is sell out Russia medal US presidential election by using hacking in, in, in political information, spreading fake news and using Facebook or something like that. So what I want to ask you is, do you, how do you assess the possibility that China would use this kind of method to influence Taiwanese election? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, my old friend. Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I think that I will go for a so-called silence intrusion uh, to uh, this issue. Uh, because um, as we all know, nowadays, the social media has been very popular, uh, not only for uh, social life, but also for uh, some political issues. So um, uh, how to uh, manipulate the opinions, the public opinions online? I think that would be the case, especially for uh, election years or election circumstances. So uh, it, uh, it, in that sense, uh, how we are going to avoid uh, uh, inferences from outside of Taiwan, uh, including China, I think uh, uh, that will be a uh, case for us. So uh, uh, my understanding is, uh, first of all, uh, we have to make sure our social media is clean. And uh, second, uh, secondly, uh, we have to uh, uh, watch over the social activities so carefully and uh, to see uh, whether, whether or not there are some, uh, you know, uh, uh, deceived uh, information uh, posting online or uh, try to lead uh, the public opinions. Um, but uh, I have to say it's not very easy because uh, if we go back to democratic system, uh, it's not very easy to accuse or to, uh, you know, uh, say someone uh, is uh, going to put a false information online. So, um, uh, but uh, technically speaking, uh, we can have uh, some uh, technical uh, mechanism we can make in order to avoid uh, that kind of things happening uh, in the social media. So, uh, as far as I know, um, uh, Taiwanese government, uh, uh, in order to uh, deal with the election uh, coming, so uh, uh, we have a very good model is, uh, uh, we, uh, when, when the election for Taipei mayor, uh, we had a very good solution uh, for this problem. So I think uh, we might uh, apply the experience onto the election 2018 for this issue. What were the takeaways from that, the Ta Taipei mayoral election? What mm -hmm. was the key thing that you learned? You said you had a good system. What was the basis of the system? Uh, the, the system for uh, for the Taipei mayor election a few years ago. Um, that's because uh, uh, I, I'm not so sure of the details, but uh, uh, what I know is the, uh, they, they have a team uh, to uh, watch over the online opinions very carefully, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they also uh, try to use uh, so-called SAS uh, software mm -hmm. to do some text mining mm -hmm. in order to make sure uh, some key words, the key terms, are in a certain uh, safe label. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, for instance, like uh, uh, if you see some terms which is very unusually, uh, provocally, uh, uh, very high and to lead the whole public opinion mm -hmm. uh, in that social media, mm -hmm. uh, for example, like Facebook, mm -hmm. or uh, for example, like uh, 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 Lines, uh, mm -hmm. which is very popular in Taiwan, I think that, that will make a very different opinion, a very different result for the uh, election. So yeah. uh, that, that's the case I would like to mention. Yeah. Good. OK, uh, in the back there. Yep. Hi, Dr. Huang, uh, Paul Huang, reporter for the Epoch Times. Uh, I wonder, to your knowledge, what, what are Taiwan's policies when you come to retaliation against cyber attack? For example, if a massive attack is detected coming from China, uh, from a certain group or certain office, what would Taiwan do? Is, has there been any official description or policies about what Taiwan do? Because like the latest US uh, national security strategy on this is very clear. It says United States will take swift action against any foreign government groups, criminal and, and retaliation against them. So they seem to apply the United States from at least for from the Trump administration, that implies an immediate retaliation. Would Taiwan do the same? And has 
to your knowledge? Uh, it's also a very tough question. <laughs> but uh, I would say retaliation is not very easy. It's easy to say, but easy, it's not very easy to conduct. Uh, because uh, you have to have a, a name, okay, a, a, a legal name in order to make a retaliation uh, in terms of uh, 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 so-called engage of, uh, of war, engagement of war, war of engagement. Um, uh, for example, like a few years ago, um, uh, there's a Sony uh, company hacked by a North Korean hacker, and uh, uh, by the end, uh, uh, the the president at that time, Obama, he said, uh, uh, if I remember it correctly, he said that that's a, a, a joke, uh, it's a, a bungalism. But uh, in the end, uh, he the government used uh, economic uh, sanction to deal with this so-called uh, uh, joke. So I think it's not a very equal, right? Uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, a cyber attack is a uh, not only international circumstances, but also in a uh, transnational circumstances, so that we are not able to apply international law to deal with international disputes, uh, I'm sorry, transnational disputes. So uh, go back to your question, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's very easy to conduct so-called retaliation uh, for cyber attack. But uh, the thing we can do is, uh, is to encourage uh, the geographical location being traced back to uh, cyber attacks. Uh, to take the responsibility for uh, this, dispute, this, uh, this attack or disputes, uh, no matter whether the attack is sponsored by the government or not. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, if the attack is from Taiwan, I think the Taiwanese government uh, had no choice, has no choice but to take the responsibility anyway. So uh, I think that, that will be the best way to, to deal with the attacks rather than just you know, make a retaliation uh, uh, major to the attack. I, think, uh, I don't think that will be a, a good idea. Yeah, up in the front here. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Sato Shinshihata from the Liberty and Happy Science Group. Uh, my question is about the North Korean hacking techniques, uh, because my understanding is uh, North Korean hacking group was responsible for a uh, series of uh, hacking on the SWIFT system in Taiwan, the banking system uh, last year. And I, I wonder uh, how a North Korean uh, hacking group has, uh, uh, has been establishing their techniques. So the, what is the resource of, uh, for them, their techniques? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to give you a workshop <laughs> about how to uh, deal with uh, this attack. But uh, uh, in general, I, I would say, um, because I also have some Korean friends, uh, South Korean friends, okay, uh, dealing with the cyber attacks and, uh, from a legal pr perspective. So I think, um, uh, like I said earlier, there are three major uh, hackers uh, has been accused uh, uh, in the recent years. The first one is uh, Chinese hackers, the second one is Cor North Koreans, and uh, Russians as well. So um, uh, go back to your question, uh, the, when uh, the Taiwanese bank uh, SWIFT uh, server has been hacked by uh, North Korean hackers, um, uh, that's why I would like to show you how Taiwanese uh, cyber defensive capability is. Uh, even though uh, the money has been taken in the first place, but uh, uh, just a couple of days, the money has been transferred back to uh, the bank in Taiwan. Uh, I think it's 90, nearly 99%. So, uh, uh, so uh, in reality, from what I understand, we, have, uh, uh, we, we work with the South Korean government in this regard very closely, uh, especially uh, uh, under the private sector. So, uh, um, so that's why uh, we understand the, the hacking patterns, so uh, we can uh, trust back to uh, the, the source very quickly. Uh, like I said, I, I'm not able to give you a, a lesson about it, but, uh, but uh, uh, that's how we see uh, cooperation is very important, uh, not only uh, to cooperate with uh, uh, Korea, but also with Japan. 
So, and uh, of course, the United States. Uh, I think overall, um, cyberspace is a uh, very vital space for human beings and for states uh, in international arena. So, uh, how we can uh, overlook and uh, forget about uh, uh, political issues to work together with uh, in cyberspace? I think that, that that's the case. So, uh, uh, that, that's the answer I would like to provide you. Sam, did you want to throw anything in on just sort of general North Korean capabilities or? Uh, uh, but it's a, okay. Um, Mike. Thanks very much for your presentation. I'm Mike Fonte. I'm the director of the DPP's mission here in Washington. Um, DPP has, uh, government has a new southbound policy. I'm wondering if any of your expertise in cyber, cyberspace has been shared or whether you have any programs that you're working with the, the, the people in the south, the countries in the southbound area. Thank you. Um, simply speaking, uh, uh, I think uh, in terms of IT capability, uh, uh, India is also a country, uh, a good country for us to work with. So uh, lately, um, from what I understand, uh, we uh, created some project under the so-called task force to uh, create a cooperation in not only in uh, industrial label, but also uh, in kind of like a, a non-governmental label. So, uh, so I think in this regard, uh, uh, Taiwan and India uh, uh, lady uh, work together very closely, uh, and not only to uh, build up a, a cyber partnership, but also to fulfill the so-called new South Bank policy from Taiwan. So, uh, simply speaking, uh, I think that that will be the example uh, for you for your question. Yeah. Great. And with that, we're at time. So, uh, <laughs> please thank me in joining Dr. Huang uh, for his great <laughs> presentation.